Good morning, class. We're going to need to go over some of the basic information about 1 Corinthians. And let me start out by talking about the book and then the city. The book of 1 Corinthians is written on Paul's third missionary trip while Paul is at the city of Ephesus. While he is at Ephesus, there are some people that write to him. They have questions. And Paul spends 1 Corinthians answering those questions. Before the book of um, Corinthians, Paul had written 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Galatians was probably his first book. And uh, then we have the book of, of um, 1 Corinthians. It's somewhat a middle epistle, but it is on Paul's third missionary trip when it is written. The city of Corinth. It was a very, very wicked city. It is located on the Greek peninsula. If you can see the map at all, uh, the city of Corinth is located right there. Um, there is a little peninsula below the main Greek peninsula, the Peloponnesus, and right at that little neck that connects the two of a, almost an island is the city of Corinth. Ships would come in from one direction, they would carry them over land, and they would depart the other direction. Uh, just a few miles between the sea on both sides. It's a very, very busy seaport. It's one of the largest cities in the Roman Empire. It may be third or fourth largest city. We have the city of Rome, the city of Alexandria, Antioch, and uh, Corinth and Antioch are somewhere around the same size. Ephesus is also a large city. Uh, Thessalonica will be as well as some other places. But Corinth is a very large city. It's a seaport, mainly a Greek city, but there are a lot of foreigners here. And because there's a lot of foreigners, there are a lot of foreign languages. There are a lot of men who've come in on the ships. And... You know, they get off board being on ship for a period of time, and they act wild. The city of Corinth was a wicked place, even among the Roman Empire, which was known for its wickedness. Corinth would have been considered likely the most wicked city in the Roman Empire. One of the problems was their religion. The temple there is thought to have had as many as 1,000 prostitutes. So, with that in mind, Paul has gone to the city of Corinth, and in the middle of this great wickedness, God has established a church. You know, I do think it is incredible how God is able to take his people, and in the middle of great wickedness, establish a number of saints that serve God. But, the church has been affected by the culture. Now, the church shouldn't be affected by the culture. We should not be affected by our culture. But it was. And we are too. And because of the culture and because of everybody around, this is, a, this is a church that has many, many problems. In fact, we can take a look at almost every problem we have today. And it seems like it was there at Corinth. I mean, we have a problem with people thinking they're wise, wiser than God, and wanting to interpret the way things ought to be. We have a problem in the church with immorality. We have a problem in the church of people suing each other. We have a problem with marriage. Uh, we have a problem of, um, you know, women cutting their hair and women wanting to seize authority, and we've got a problem with the Lord's Supper and eating in church. We've got a problem with spiritual gifts and speaking in tongues, and we have a problem theologically about the resurrection. I mean, you can just list it all. There is one problem after another, and every single one of those problems they had, we have today as well. In fact, sometimes I think I wonder if maybe God picked up some kind of a modern conglomerate of people that 
have the problems of today, transplanted them back to the first century and planted them right there in Corinth and says, I need to write to those people of the 20th century and the 21st century, and so I'm going to put them back here in the city of Corinth, and then I can talk about the problems the future is going to have. But the reality is it may have been 2,000 years ago, but people today are very little different than they were back then. We sin today, they sin back then. There was wickedness today, there was wickedness back then. A big city with footloose men, full of wickedness, a big city, the same thing today. So let's talk about some of the various problems they have. One of the problems is they have a city or a church that is divided into four different parties. You have those that said, I like Apollos. That man is an orator. And he was. The Bible said he was not only an orator, but mighty in the scriptures. And they said, I like Apollos. Somebody else said, no, 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 no. I like Paul. That guy has, you know, the logic. And somebody said, well, if we're going to pick some side to be on, I'm on Peter's side. He's the leader of the church. Somebody else said, well, you guys can follow men if you want to, but us super spiritual people, let's, let's just be followers of Christ. Now, we don't know for sure if these were actually just sort of a picture that Paul is setting up, or if actually these are the categories in which people were fighting over, we'll assume they are. And so this church was divided into the followers of Apollos, the followers of Paul, the followers of Peter, and the super spiritual ones that said, we just follow Christ. And today, we have people that, I follow this one, I follow that one, I follow this other one, and some super spiritual people that say, oh, we don't follow anybody. They actually do. They tell you they don't, but they do. They follow Christ. So anyway, divisions. Now, Paul has something to say about divisions. Here's what he says. Over in chapter 3, verse 1, Paul will make this statement. For ye are yet carnal. For wherein there is among you envying and strife and divisions. Are ye not carnal and walk as men? For one saith, I am of Paul. And another, I am of Apollos. Are ye not carnal? Who then is Apollo? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. Yes, they had their divisions. They had a problem with the wisdom of the world. The philosophy of this world infiltrating into the church. And let me just put it this way. We have that same problem today. We go by God's word. Not by some philosophical degrees of philosophers of today that seem to think they know everything. But they had the same thing back then. The Greeks of that day thought they knew everything. And, to put it simply, as far as intellectual power, we are in no whit smarter than they were back then. But what does God say about that? Here's what God says about that. He said the Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. To put it in simple language, God is far above man, and a sinner cannot understand about God or theology. What does he say? The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And let me put it this way, a sinner does not have the ability to understand the truth of God. Deep down inside of the sinner's heart is a carnal mind that wants its own way and that is willing to subvert truth 
to make it say what he wants it to say, rather than honestly and openly accepting God's evaluation of what truth really is. Now, a person who's saved, but unsanctified, has a limited ability to understand truth as well. Because down inside of the human heart is something that says, I want my own way. I want it to say what I want it to say. And so they go into the scripture with a prejudiced idea of trying to defend their own actions rather than honestly and openly saying from the depths of their heart, I want to understand whatever God says. A problem with lawsuits. I'm sorry, a problem with immorality. Namely, they had a problem with incest. A man was living with his stepmother. Paul makes this statement. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And then they had the audacity to write to Paul and say, what do you think we ought to do? Should we accept them? They were quite proud of the grace of God, which is something to be proud of, and pointing out how God had forgiven this man his sins, but look at what he's doing. So they said, Paul, what should we do? Now Paul makes this statement. He just says, this is, you know, basically in our language, he said, this isn't something I have to figure out. He said, I'm absent in body, but present in spirit and judged already. He said, deliver such a one into Satan. That's the equivalent of saying, kick him out of the church. I mean, Paul said, do not tolerate open outbroken sin of this magnitude in the church. It has no place in our midst. In other words, give them the boot. Well, the Bible also teaches that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, what that means is this physical body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The context is this. Since our body belongs to God, it should not be given over to immorality and fornication. That is the direct meaning of this passage. We use that passage for other things. For example, we would use this passage to say that a person should not smoke. Why? Our body doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. And it just simply says that if we destroy the body, him shall God destroy. Well, we can go too far with this, but we do have a responsibility to take care of the physical body. Smoking, by far, is the most damaging thing you can do to the physical body as far as causing people to die prematurely. It far exceeds everything else. As well as the fact that since this body doesn't belong to us, smoking doesn't really leave a good image out there. You know, as people look at the temple, it shouldn't have a smokestack. Let me just give you another thought. All of this passage is mainly addressing fornication. We have addressed smoking with it because our body doesn't belong to us. What about tattoos? Does God want graffiti on his temple? I don't think so. It is forbidden in the Old Testament. But the basic principle is this. We belong to God. And since we belong to God, we should not mark up God's temple. It should be holy. 
lawsuits. Apparently they had some people in the church that were suing each other. That's not a good thing either. Let me give you three principles that this passage lays down. First of all, a Christian should not sue a fellow Christian. It says here, secondly, that it is better to suffer wrong than to sue another Christian. And thirdly, if there is a division between two Christians that needs to be taken to law, they should instead go to another fellow Christian and let them decide what is the right thing to do. Can you imagine two Christians go to a secular court, stand in front of an ungodly and in reality pagan judge, either in their world or ours, fight it out? What kind of an impression? do they get over Christianity? I know of an instance where a holiness preacher got upset at some people in his church. He called up another preacher that was of another completely different theological persuasion to find out some information on that individual to use against them. And I can just imagine that from that point on, that preacher in that other group, who I doubt if you believe, he believed you could live above sin, probably said, you know these perfectionists out there, they have this big, lofty profession, and guess what? I got a call from one of their preachers. Trying to find out what somebody else had done. They have a big profession, he would probably say, but they don't live it. What a terrible name. Should we ever be guilty of that? Absolutely not. So, Christians should not sue fellow Christians. It's better to suffer wrong than to sue. And if there is a division, it should be given to a fellow believer to decide. Chapter 7 is a big long chapter that deals with the subject of marriage and um, not being married, celibacy. Let me just give you a few principles that it gives in this passage. It says that a person who has a spouse which is not a believer, that you are not to leave them. Secondly, if you're separated from an unbelieving spouse, you are not to remarry. Let me read to you exactly what it says in this passage right here. Chapter 7, verse 7. For I would, chapter 7, verse, not 7, but um, verse 12. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. But if the unbelieving depart, let them depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. And in verse 11 it says, But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. It also says, Let not the wife depart from her husband. An interesting thought is given here in chapter 7 as well. And Paul is going to say, I do speak this by permission and not by commandment. I still think it's the inspired word of God. I still think there's words of wisdom right here. Paul makes it very clear that if you marry, it's perfectly fine. You have not sinned. But Paul advocates the unmarried life. In our society today, sometimes we look at marriage as though it is the ultimate and anybody that is not married has somehow failed in life. That is not the way the Bible gives it. The Bible brings out the idea 
that God has a place for everyone, married or unmarried. And in Paul's opinion, the unmarried state was far better than the married state. I think part of that had to do with the, Paul's life. Paul, part of it had to do with probably Paul's experiences. Part of it had to do with the times in which he was living. But you know, there's some people today that don't get married. Or there's some people, they've had been married and it has failed. Does that mean they're really left out of being all they can be for God? Paul gives you the advantages of being single. First of all, he said, time is short. The Lord's coming back at some point, he said. Or there's so much to do and so short of a life that we've got too much to do without getting married. Time is short. He said being single is a lot better in persecution. And I really don't think you can debate that. If you're single, you can handle the persecution. But when the one you love or your children are the ones being facing the persecution. It is much more difficult. Paul said they can be a more effective worker. And in reality, the kind of work that Paul was involved in, where he traveled around evangelizing, he could be a more effective worker. He was free to travel and free to go. Let me give you a fellow, another example of that. Among the Methodists, Francis Asbury here in the United States chose deliberately to be single so that he could travel, so that he could evangelize, so that he could reach as many people as possible with as few of hindrances as possible. He advocated the Methodist preachers not to marry for the same reason. And many of those chose to be single for the same reason. They turned America upside down for God. Some of them did choose to get married, they did not oppose it or say it was wrong, but much of the many of the circuit riders, they were single, deliberately and intentionally for God. In our world today, some of the greatest workers for God have been mainly women who were single, that were able to travel, and uh, constantly have worked for God, especially on the mission field and in Christian day schools. Our church world today would be well, badly deprived if we have not had those women who have done what they did. Another reason why it's better to be single is because he said there's a tendency for married people to, carry, to care more for the things of the world. And you know, in reality, that's true. When you're married... You want to do something to please your spouse. When you're single, you can put your whole focus on serving God. So, the advantages of being single is because time is short. It's better in persecution. They can be a more effective worker. And there is a tendency for married people to care more for the things of the world. In the aspect of marriage, a person is not to separate from an unbelieving spouse. And if they are separated, they were not to remarry. Moving on, chapter 8 talks about concern for others. We should not do anything that causes another person to backslide. This is a similar passage to what is found in Romans chapter 14. Let me read you one verse out of this. And uh, here's Paul making a statement here. He says this, Wherefore, if meat, that's the eating of meat offered to idols, which he said is perfectly fine to do, wherefore, if eating meat make my brother to offend, and that means to backslide, that's what he means by offend there, if meat make my brother to backslide, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Let me lay down the principle. Our goal is to get as many people as possible to heaven. And if the actions that we do causes another individual to backslide for their sake, not for ours, but for theirs, we refrain from doing it. Chapter 10. 
mentions that God has the power to deliver. We have a great verse in chapter 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It makes this statement, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. But with the temptation, also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Let me give you three principles out of this as far as temptation is concerned. It, it simply says that God always provides a way of escape in all temptation. There's always a way of escape. Secondly, it's common to everyone. We may feel like we're the only ones that have ever faced it. That's not true. Other people have. Thirdly, God will not allow us to suffer that which we're unable to bear. He puts a load limit on us. You know, as you approach a bridge, you see a little sign at the right. It says, load limit. You know, 40,000 pounds. That's what the bridge will take. God puts beside you a load limit. And as the devil looks at you, he sees that load limit and he knows that is the maximum that I can put on that individual without God intervening. God will not tolerate anymore. So in temptation, don't give up. God's on your side. He says very, very simply that there's always a way to escape. That everybody else goes through it and some of those have come through victorious. You can too. And God will not allow you to be tempted above that you're able to bear. Well, chapter 11 gives us another aspect of a problem they have. And this has to do with hair. Women and hair length. Hair in this passage is a symbol of authority. A man's hair should be short and cut as representative of us coming under authority to God. A woman's hair should be long and feminine, representing that she's coming under the authority of her husband. That is the basic underlying thought in this passage. It says here that women should not cut their hair. If you drop down just a few verses in verse number 6, it'll chapter 11, verse 6, it says it's a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, for her hair to be cut off or to be cut at all. That is, if you emphasize the differences between the words shorn and shaven. Her long hair, it says, is given to her as a covering, a symbol. Her long hair is that symbol of subjection to her husband. You know, if a person begins cutting their hair, there's a tendency to keep cutting. While I was down at the Lutheran Theological Seminary, it was pointed out that in Romans chapter 1, where it talks about gay marriage, or where it talks about gays, and doing that which is unnatural. The professor pointed out this. That he said, why do we say that this is so wrong, that is, gay marriage, or behaving like gays, why do we say that is so wrong, when if you go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the same Greek word fusis, that's used for unnatural, is likewise used in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 to talk about hair length. And... Uh, He was making his point. One we accept, he said, 
And I was sitting in a class of which probably half of them were ladies, all with cut hair. He says, why do we make such a big point about one? Paul said one's not natural. Paul said the other is are natural for a man to have. It's not natural for a man to have long hair. It's a shame unto him. And the reality is this. There's some people that would like to say, well, that was their custom back then. For men to have short hair or cut hair and for women to have long hair. We have a different custom today. And uh, we don't have their customs anymore. We make that argument. The people that believe in gay marriage make the same argument. Their custom back then was that this was wrong. We have a different custom today. And today we accept it. Once you start taking the words of God in the Bible and try to make it culturally relative, that is in the New Testament, and try to make it culturally relative and say that was just written for that time, but not ours. What can't you say was just written for that time, but not ours? It undermines all of the Word of God. But here, hair is in the context of authority. It's clear that women's hair should be long and men's hair should be short. And that is used, likewise, to say it is not natural for men to have long hair or for women to have short hair. Another problem they had, they had a problem with the Lord's Supper, a problem with them eating in the church and arguing over who could eat what. And Paul admonished them to eat at home. They had a problem with spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians. Um, there are many parts of the body, and each has a different gift. The eye is not the ear, the hand is not the foot. Each part of the human body has its own thing that it does. The eye sees, the ears hear, the feet run, the nose smells, the mouth speaks, and if every part of the body does what it's supposed to do, the body operates like it's supposed to operate. And if the body of Jesus Christ, the church, if everybody does what they're supposed to do, finds their place and asks, what is my place, and does it, the body of Christ operates like it's supposed to. But when somebody doesn't do their part, it doesn't function like it needs to. Let me also say this. If there's a part of the body that quits functioning like it's supposed to, rather than cutting it out, expelling it, getting rid of it, you know, we're hammering away. And then we hit the wrong nail. Our first reaction is to grab that thumb. Put it in our mouth. Suck on it. Do whatever we can to help that finger. We don't say, oh, dumb nail. You should have got out. You shouldn't have been there in the way. Stupid thing. How do we treat people in the body of Christ when they're hurt? When they fail to do what they're supposed to. Do we work? To bring them back into where they need to be. That's chapter 12 where it talks about the various gifts, the spiritual gifts. There are many parts of the body. Each has a different gift. And all people do not have the same gift. Chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians is the love chapter. It breaks into the middle of the topic about talking about spiritual gifts. We could spend a lot of time talking about chapter 13, but let me just give you a few little thoughts right here. Love is greater. Divine love in the heart, agape love, that's the kind of love it's talking about here, the love of God, is greater than some other things. It says, the, it says, though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not charity or divine love, 
I am a sounding brass. I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Now, speaking in the, with the tongues of men and of angels could be considered oratorical ability. And there are some people that have the power to just simply, in their oratorical ability, to move the masses. But it takes more than that. Some would think that perhaps this is talking about speaking in angelic tongues and foreign languages. If that is the ability and a person could actually speak in the language that only angels could understand. And a language that, only, that people elsewhere could understand. But we don't really have love? What does it matter? Love is greater than self-sacrifice. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Self-sacrifice doesn't do it without love. The Pharisees fasted twice in the week, but got no merit for it, because it was done without love. And then... Divine knowledge. Love is greater than divine knowledge. It says here, And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, it says I'm nothing. I don't care how brilliant you are, or how much you know, until I know that you care, that you love. It says, I am nothing. And likewise, love is greater than faith. And though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. So love is greater than oratorical ability, speaking in tongues of men and of angels. It's greater than self-sacrifice. It's greater than knowledge. And it's greater than having faith to move mountains. Love is greater than each one of these. Chapter 14 talks about the gift of tongues. Most of what I spoke about this passage I gave when we talked about the first couple chapters in the book of Acts. But here, Paul advocates that they need divine love rather than seeking gifts. He points out that tongues is one of the lesser gifts. In chapter 12, he actually talks about uh, a whole list of gifts, starting with uh, the gift of prophecy and going on down and the gift of miracles. And He finally gets down to the gift of tongues and the gift of interpretations. And he asks the questions, does everybody have each one of these? And no, the answer is no, they don't. So, really, tongues is a lesser gift. And all Christians do not speak with tongues. You will find that found in chapter 12, verses 29 and 30. Tongues is a lesser gift. All Christians do not speak with tongues. Let me tell you what was going on at Corinth. The Greek people, the Oracle of Delphi, he was considered a prophet, and they had a crack in the earth which smoke came up from the ground, and if you wanted to have an answer to a problem that you were facing, you could go to the Oracle of Delphi, and he would take a young lady, a priestess, hold her over that uh, crack in the earth where the smoke was coming up until she passed out. Then they would drag her out of the smoke. As she came to, she began to babble in some kind of an unknown garbled something. They would have an interpreter there who would then interpret what she was saying and answer your question. That same thing was being copied at Corinth. They had their temple. They had their sacrifices. They would hold young priestesses over the smoke from the sacrifices till they passed out. They would have an interpreter there. You could get your questions answered. And thus you have in 1 Corinthians 14 where it says tongues is not a sign to them that believe, but a sign to them that believe not. 
it looks like some of those practices had made their way into the Christian church. Likewise, the church was full of all kinds of foreigners. They felt the Spirit of God. They wanted to testify. So you might have somebody testifying in the Macedonian language and somebody testifying in the Aramaic language, in the Egyptian language, in the Libyan language, and you had a massive confusion of people of different nationalities that all came together and all wanted to testify in their own language. Now that's perfectly fine. If we have somebody that speaks Spanish in our church and God's done something for them, we want to hear their testimony. But could you imagine if you had one after another and nobody understood anything? Their services had become a massive confusion. So Paul put some limits on it. He says this. He limited their use. He said, you can only have three times that somebody speaks in an unknown tongue in your service. Secondly, it's got to be one at a time. It's got to be by course. And thirdly, there must be an interpreter or let them keep silence in the church. So, that was what he said. He said, don't forbid them. But let's put these limits on these things and let's do everything orderly. Anyway, that's Paul's position on the gift of tongues. Chapter 15 talks about the resurrection. Let me just give you a couple things about the resurrection here. The resurrection is the foundation of Christianity. If Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, our faith is vain. As Paul said, we are yet in our sins. But did Jesus Christ did rise from the dead. And because he did rise from the dead, we too have hope. And the promise is this, that one of these days, our physical bodies will rejoin our spirits. Secondly, the new body which we're given will be a body that will not decay. And thirdly, it is going to happen in a moment of time, in an instant. That's the resurrection. Our physical bodies will rejoin our spirits. The body we're given will not decay, and it will happen in an instant. This leads Paul to say, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Let me just read a little bit from this passage here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is a very great passage for the Christian of what God has planned at some point. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's skipping through some of the passages in chapter 15 near the end of that passage, talking about the resurrection. Especially notice that the resurrection is going to happen in the twinkling of an eye, in a moment of time, when our bodies shall come from the ground if we're dead, or from here if we're alive. And we will be given an un corruptible body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, they were taking up a collection for the poor saints of Jerusalem. This collection occurred on the very first day of the week, implying that the church was meeting on the first day of the week. In other words, their Sabbath was the Lord's day. That seems to have been their practice. 
A few chapters that you need to know is you should know that chapter, chapter 7 is about marriage. Chapter 11 is about hair. Chapter 13 is about love. Chapter 14 is about the gift of tongues. And chapter 15 is about the resurrection of the body. Well, thank you for listening. Have a good day.